So we need to have a case study of the Arctic tundra. Um, and this is the second of our major case studies. If you remember, we have a case study of the Amazon rainforest. And in a similar way to where we looked at that um, case study, we need to look at the water cycle and the carbon cycle specific to the tundra. And we need to look at the physical factors that are affecting those flows and stores. We need to look at the seasonal changes. We need to look at the impacts of humans in the Arctic on the water and the carbon cycle. And then we need to look at some of the management strategies that are being used there. And if you click on that YouTube clip there, you'll probably think I've gone mad. It's a bit of a random clip, but this is from a program called the Mighty Boosh. It's an old program. Um, if any of you watch the Bake Off, then you might recognize Noel in a former life in the clip. So the distribution of the Arctic tundra, it's actually a huge area. It's 8 million kilometers squared, and it covers that northern part of Canada, Alaska, which is obviously an American state, and then Siberia, that huge section of Russia. And when we actually look at the ecosystem, you've got from in the south, the boreal forest, the coniferous forest, all the way up to the Arctic Ocean. So the southern limit to the Arctic tundra is about the 10 degree Celsius July isotherm. So this is the line at which the temperature reaches 10 degrees in July. And that is the limit of the tree line. So if you have a look at that picture down at the bottom right hand corner, you can see the coniferous trees and you can see that they they pretty much come to a stop. There are a few dotted further towards us, but you can basically see the tree line. And what we're seeing is that 10 degree C isotherm and been past that point towards us it's just too cold for the trees to grow. So that's our tree line. So here we've got a climate graph and this is from Baffin Island, which is in Canada. Um, and remember climate graphs show us precipitation as the bar graph at the bottom, in this case it's green, and temperature. We've got several different lines there for temperature. If we look at the key, we can see that the average temperature is in pink, maximum temperature is in red and minimum temperature is shown in blue um, and what we can see on that climate graph quite clearly is that warmer summer period that the arctic has if you remember back to gcse unlike antarctica the arctic does have that short summer period where the temperatures do rise above freezing and so we can see there that the, the maximum temperatures get up to about eight or nine degrees in July. Uh, and as a result of that, we know that that top meter or so of uh, permafrost does thaw out and we do get some life during that short summer period. But we can also see that the temperatures really drop off in the winter. And remember, the sun doesn't come above the horizon for several months. The longer uh, periods of darkness are the further north you get. But you've got several months at least of darkness. There is no input at all from the sun. No energy is coming in. No heat is coming in. So for eight or nine months of the year, the tundra has what we call a negative heat balance. There is more heat being lost than is actually coming in. Permafrost, we've talked about this many times. Um, I listened to a really interesting lecture in the summer about permafrost um, and the actual definition is given there in red. So permafrost is a thermal condition of the soil whereby temperatures remain below zero for at least two consecutive winters. And it's solely dependent on temperature and time, not on the presence of water. And there's a couple of really good videos there that I really recommend that you watch to give you a really good overview of what we mean by permafrost. 
So obviously we've got a very extreme environment, a very extreme climate. And so very few plants and animals have actually adapted to this extreme environment. Therefore, biodiversity is extremely low. So remember, we've got to be constantly comparing and contrasting to the Amazon rainforest. So the Amazon rainforest has extremely high biodiversity. The tundra, that biodiversity is the complete opposite. It's very, very low. Apart from a few dwarf species, we don't have any trees in the Arctic. So there again, complete contrast to the Amazon rainforest, which is obviously full of trees. But as we've said, the further south you get in the Arctic, the conditions become less severe. So there is more vegetation in the south, particularly during the summer months. And then the further north you get towards the North Pole, the harsher the conditions are, the less vegetation you will see at all. So let's have a look at the water cycle in the tundra. There's very little precipitation. Remember, we've got high pressure in charge. High equals dry. We call them the polar highs. Most precipitation that does fall, and it's only between 50 and 350 millimetres a year, is falling as snow. And that snow will then turn to ice. There's very little moisture in the atmosphere because it's so cold. So there's very little in the in the way of humidity at all. So again, let's compare that to the Amazon rainforest where there's huge volumes of moisture in the atmosphere. So again, it's the complete opposite. Very little transpiration because there's very little vegetation. So there is no vegetation to carry out that evapotranspiration. Only during that very short summer period will we have any sort of evapotranspiration because that is the only period of the year where there is vegetation growing in the Arctic. And very low rates of evaporation. The sun, when it is out, is used is using all of its energy to melt the snow. There's very, very little convection at all. And also most of the water is frozen, so it's not going to evaporate anyway. So again, let's contrast that to the rainforest where you've got that extremely fast precipitation evapotranspiration feedback loop going on. There's none of that here. It's all incredibly slow in terms of the water cycle. There's very little water stored in the groundwater or in the soil. The permafrost stops infiltration. It makes the ground impermeable. It makes it completely solid. You can see a picture there at the top right. And you can see that top meter has thawed out. But beneath that, the ground is like a block of ice. There is no way water is going to be able to infiltrate or percolate through that. So there is very limited water in the ground or in the soil. But we do have some marked seasonal changes taking place in the water cycle with that summer season, with that short summer season where the temperatures do get above freezing. So obviously throughout the winter, we've had a huge accumulation of snow and ice. But then as the temperatures start to rise, we do start to see that snow and ice melting and that top metre of the permafrost does start to thaw out. So we see a huge increase in river flow as we come into that Arctic summer. But because the ground is impermeable, the ground is frozen, that water tends to sit on the surface. So you can see there in that bottom right picture, a river is formed, but it's it's on the surface and you can see that it's sort of formed on top of that frozen ground. So we do get some wetlands, we do get some ponds and lakes during the summer as a temporary store of liquid on the surface. So what about the carbon cycle in the tundra? So the permafrost, that permanently frozen ground, is a really important store of carbon. It's a really important carbon sink. We reckon it's got about 1,600 gigatons of carbon stored within it, that permafrost layer. 
And this is because of the really extreme low temperatures, which makes decomposition of any dead plant material extremely slow. So where we do get vegetation during the, the summer season, it's then decomposing at an extremely slow rate. And we've got a huge amount of organic matter locked up within that permanently frozen ground. The amount of carbon in the tundra soils is five times greater than we've got in any sort of plants and vegetation. That is the, the biggest store of carbon in the tundra. So you could contrast that to the, the rainforest where you've got that huge store of carbon above ground in the trunks and the branches of the trees. In the tundra, it's stored beneath the ground in the soils. But again, we've got seasonal changes associated with that summer season. So during the summer, when that top meter or so, the active layer, we refer to it as thaws, you get this very, very rapid growth of plants. And remember, we've got 24 hours of sunlight, the complete opposite to the winter. There, the sun doesn't go down at all for several months. And if you've got 24 hours of sunlight, you can have 24 hours of photosynthesis. So those plants, they grow extremely fast and they flower and they spread their seed and they're, they're sort of ready to die by the time that short summer season is over. So we've not got a huge amount of net primary productivity, definitely not compared to the rainforest. The, the biomass is, is really quite small. But during the summer season, those tundra plants do put carbon into the soil. And we do start to see an increase in decomposition. The bacteria, the decomposers are able to come to life. They are able to decompose and their respiration then does put CO2 into the atmosphere. It's not just during the summer that you get carbon dioxide and methane emissions though. In the winter you sometimes get these pockets of unfrozen soil and water and, and they act as sources of carbon through carbon dioxide and, and methane. And sometimes the snow acts as sort of like an insulator on top of those microbial organisms and allows them to function, makes it warm enough for them to actually carry out their work. Uh, so you can have a little look at this clip here that looks at the health of the Arctic. So in the past, we can clearly see that the, the permafrost has been a really important store of carbon in the tundra. Um, but what we've seen is with global warming, that, so, that um, source of carbon within the permafrost is now starting to thaw out. And if that frozen organic matter thaws out, then the decomposers can come to life. And then we can have a release of all of that stored up carbon in the form of carbon dioxide and methane going into the atmosphere. So what we're concerned about is that the permafrost is changing from being a really important store of carbon into a source of carbon. And that flow of carbon into the atmosphere has sped up rapidly. When we talk about the carbon cycle within the tundra, we're talking about it being extremely slow. But here we can see that global warming has started to speed it up dramatically. But then some people say, well, hang on a minute. If we've got a warming climate, if we've got an output of carbon from the permafrost into the atmosphere, if there's more carbon in the atmosphere, does that mean that the plants that are around are going to be able to grow better because there's more carbon in the atmosphere? And does that mean that those extra plants that grow will be able to take in that excess carbon that's been released? If the temperatures are warmer in the Arctic, that means more vegetation can grow, more plants can grow, some of those dwarf trees can grow. They'll then take in more carbon dioxide. So will we actually end up with 
a negative feedback loop in place that restores equilibrium naturally to the Arctic. So yes, there's more carbon being released from the permafrost, but there's also more vegetation growing to take that excess carbon dioxide back in again. So when we talk about the warming in the Arctic, we, can, we need to make sure that we look at this feedback loop as well that there's the potential for. You can have a look at some of these clips. There are all kinds of things being found as the tundra thaws out. So, for example, that middle article there was some laughing gas that was released as the tundra starts to thaw. And all of the, the gases and all of the animals and potentially um, diseases are thawing out and being released into the atmosphere. So we need to be able to look at the physical factors, we need to be able to look at the seasonal changes that influence the stores and flows of water and carbon in the tundra. So in terms of physical factors, we need to be able to talk about temperature, relief and the rock permeability and porosity. So what physical factors influence the stores and flows of water in the tundra? So temperature, as we know, is well below freezing for most of the year. So water is stored as ice is stored within the ground as the permafrost. During that very short summer season, that very top active layer, the top meter of the soil thaws out and liquid water is then found on the surface. It's found on the surface because it cannot infiltrate because the frozen ground is impermeable but you do get lots of pools and shallow lakes forming across the landscape. In the winter, because it's below zero, we do not have any evapotranspiration. In the summer, we do get some evapotranspiration because we've got standing water up on the surface. Humidity is low all year round though, and precipitation is very small. In terms of permeability, it's very low because you've got that permanently frozen ground. But also when we do look at the geology of the Arctic and subarctic Canada, for example, we've got these crystalline rocks. We've got these very resistant rocks, which are inherently impermeable anyway. There's very minimal relief. So if you look at the left hand picture, it's just flat and that tundra just goes on for miles and miles and miles. It all just looks the same. Nothingness, as they talked about in that very first clip of the slideshow. But you do get some rather chaotic glacial deposits. So the glaciers have dropped off these erratics and they do impede drainage and add to sort of a waterlogging situation that we find in the summer. What about the carbon cycle? What physical factors influence the stores and flows of carbon? So the carbon is mainly stored as partly decomposed plant remains that are frozen within the soil, frozen within that permafrost. Most of the carbon in the tundra has been locked away for at least 500,000 years. The low temperatures, the unavailability of liquid water for most of the year, and the fact that the rocks contain very few nutrients means that very little in the way of plants grow. Therefore, the total carbon store in biomass or in vegetation is extremely small. Vegetation, when we look across the whole year, photosynthesis, net primary productivity are very low. But we do have that short three months maximum growing season. And we do have 24 hours of sunlight during that period. So photosynthesis is very, very fast and very rapid. And the vegetation during that summer grows extremely rapidly, spreads its seeds and then dies off again. So there is a concentrated burst of photosynthesis and much greater net primary productivity during that summer period. But the low temperatures, the water logging, all slows down decomposition. And so the flow of carbon from that decomposition into the atmosphere 
is extremely slow. The carbon is stored rather than flowing back into the atmosphere again. Okay, so here are your questions to make sure that you have got all of your notes fully into your, uh, into your books, into your paper for this particular lesson. Any questions, just drop me a question in the discussion box.